Thank you for joining us at our systems webinar today, where we will be dealing with the collection tools on TPN. Lockdown has been an unprecedented time for landlords and property managers because of the significant change to the law where regulation placed restriction on the movement of tenants during the lockdown period. And this impacted landlords as tenants were not earning an income because as we know, almost 2.2 million South Africans have been left without a job post lockdown. Now prior to lockdown, 80% of tenants were in good standing with their rental payments. Today we are going to show you and report to you how that data has changed. Ordinarily, tenants who have fallen into default with their landlords move out of properties and we know this because TPN has a squat indicator analysis on our database, which is a simple analysis where we determine squatting tenants by looking at if your tenant has been in your property for four months, four, that's four consecutive billing cycles with no payment towards their rental account. This is a tenant who has no intention of paying and no intention of vacating the premises. This is a severe delinquency, 100%. but if you are, this is not your ordinary tenant where you are sending a letter of demand, you are canceling the agreement and they are vacating the premises, which can all occur within a 30 day cycle. And Peter is going to explain a bit more about that in today's training. Squatting tenants are tenants who refuse to pay and refuse to vacate the premises. And we have looked at this data prior to lockdown. We have looked at the number of South Africans squatting in properties, and we have also looked at how this has changed during the lockdown period. So prior to lockdown, the range was between 0.9 to 2 to 1.2% of tenants who were squatting in properties. So this is a reminder that is four months in a row of did not pay. These are the exact tenants you are credit checking to avoid. During the lockdown period, this number escalated to 2% of tenants who were squatting in properties. We've seen almost 100% increase in the number of tenants squatting in properties. But remember, this is only 2% of the tenants on the TPN database. And this number is not driven by tenants who would ordinarily squat in properties. This number is driven by tenants who have not earned an income during lockdown and have had no opportunity to move because of the restrictions placed on their movement. This number reached its peak in July and coming into August, we have already seen a significant decrease where this number has dropped to just below 2%. This is a significant decline and this is because tenants are not squatters and they are not delinquent. So as we know, it is very important to place quality tenants and majority of our tenants yeah. are quality tenants. 100%. And we remember this from the webinar we did last month. We are here to assist you in placing quality tenants, to make sure you are not placing that 1% of tenants who are likely to squat in your property. As we know, it is human nature for people to want to perform. So if your tenant is in your property and they are unable to perform and you send them a letter of demand, you demand payment from them and you cancel the lease, the quicker you action this, the quicker they move out of the property. And the data shows us this. I want to show you today how we can move that gauge that is currently sitting on 74% of tenants in good standing for Q3. And yes, I am sharing preliminary information with you today. That is 74% of tenants who are currently in good standing. And we want to show you how we can move that number to 80% as it was prior to lockdown. But we need to take responsibility as an industry to ensure that our tenants do not fall further into default because it does not benefit your tenant, nor does it benefit your investment. But remember, it is your journey and your responsibility as agent and landlord and not that of the tenant. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Jade. Good morning, YouTube. Um, like Jade said, there are lots of things that we're going to be going through today, specifically on collections and proper procedure when it comes to collections and how important that is. 
Just some administrative issues before we get going. Remember, please, you need to be logged into the TPN YouTube channel to be able to comment directly on the YouTube system. So that means if you're going to go fill out that chat right at the right hand side of your screen, you are able to go and communicate with myself, Jade, throughout the session. Jade's going to interrupt me most probably throughout the session as well. I'm sure we're going to have a lot of questions on collections today and the proper procedure to sort of uh, follow through when it comes to collections. Also, please note, we are going to have a 15 minute Q&A right at the end. You're more than welcome to ask any question that you'd like, whether it's eviction based, whether it's landlord, tenant, uh, estate agent, sectional title, property based, whatever it might be. Please ask those questions throughout the session. We are going to be sending out a feedback form link in that Q&A session during the 15 minutes and for 45 minutes thereafter. So you're gonna have about an hour to fill out that feedback form for us to get those all important CBD points uh, for today's training. But before I bore you too much with the administrative side of things, let's really get stuck into the system. And what I told Jade beforehand is I love presenting training like this. I absolutely love and enjoy giving people information about collections in South Africa because I really feel that if you follow correct procedure, you will have successful collections. And regardless of the success of the collections, collections processes in South Africa, when it comes to sending out letters of demand, sending out cancellation letters, sending out your 40 to 80 business days notice in terms of the CPA, is all process based. So even if you were to go to court and the tenant might not have vacated during that time, you already know that you followed the correct legal procedure. And if there's one thing that you should take away from the session today is there's only right, one right way to do it. There's only one procedure. We get so much communication from clients on a daily basis about how to do collections. What's the proper collection procedure? And there's so much miscommunication out there with regards to how many letters of demand you must send and when you must send the letters of demand. Must you send a seven day? Must you send a 20 business day? When can you cancel? How long must you give the tenant to vacate? So we're going to be answering those questions for you today. We're going to give you the right collection tools. We're going to give you the right methodologies, the right procedure for you to be successful during this time period, even taking into consideration the pandemic with your correct collection procedure. Wonderful. Let's get going on this. So first things first, remember to log into the TPN system with your login details provided. Click right over there and go and fill out your username and password. Now from this page, you'll remember that from the last systems training session last month, we accessed this credit checks tab. That is obviously going to open up your credit checks for you. And that page is going to show you how you can perform credit checks on individuals, consumers, PTY limiteds, closed corporations, all your juristic entities, as well as tracing consumers. But what we're focusing on today specifically is this My Data tab, as well as the rental monitoring. So I'm going to take you through the My Data tab. I'm going to show you how to send those letters of demand. I'm going to tell you proper legal procedure to be able to send those letters of demand. But even before we get going on this, look at these lovely colors that we've got on the TPN system. This is because you submit data into the Bureau. Now, I don't want to get stuck on this too much, but let's just face it. Proper collection procedure is also at the back end. It's not just sending out your letters of demand. It's not just blacklisting, because those are things you do when things have already gone wrong. Now, how do we stop this prior to things going wrong is by following proper submission procedure as well. And that's submission of data into the credit bureau each and every single month. Because remember, you are creating the immediate repercussion for non-payment by the tenant or even for positive payments by the tenant and reinforcing the positive attitude and the positive payment style of the tenant itself. So it's vitally important. That's the back procedure. That's what you've already got to do. And if you're not sure how to submit data into the bureau, please ask us a question. Please contact the, the help desk line as well. We'll put all those details in the chat so you can speak to whoever it might be at help desk or the data department to assist you with proper submission of data through any property management system. But let us go into this my data tab. 
What you'll notice from the screen already is that there is pre-populated data and this happens because the submission of data has been pushed through. We can see all the tenants currently on our portfolio. We're going to be focusing on Joe and Jane Bloggs' account today. They are not paying us. They're bad tenants or delinquent tenants at this point in time. Let's not say bad. And we need to go and follow proper collection procedure on them. Let's paint the picture here. Joe and Jane has not paid you rental. We're going to go into the account. We're going to show you how they've not paid you rental. But at this point in time, Joe and Jane have not paid rental. So from the screen, you can obviously go into your list records. You can go and update the payment profile records here on as well. You can go and add a new record if you are submitting data manually. However, we don't want you necessarily to submit data manually. If you're using Excel, please contact us. Speak to Waylon. Um, he will assist you. He's the product specialist on Rentbook. Rentbook is our free property management system that you can utilize for free for the first 20 leases that you load there on. But you can obviously go and load it manually as well. Now go and click on Joe and Jane Bloggs' account. And what you're going to see is it's automatically going to open up a lease summary for you. We're going to give you the details of the lease agreement. So the term of the lease agreement, the property, the current state, whether the lease is active, inactive, and all those lease details as well, including how many payments have been made, how many listings, so black listings, remember we talked about that last time when we did the systems training, is listings on the system is going to be your black listings or your default listings, and then the amount of letters also sent through to these particular tenants. The term of the lease agreement is indicated, when the rental is due, and what the rental amount is, as well as including the landlord details, which is going to be automatically pre-populated for you. We can go and have a look at the associated tenants. We can see there are two tenants on this uh, specific lease agreement, and this gets very important when we go and send the letters of demand. So please take note, there are two tenants on this lease. Now, to send a letter of demand off the system is incredibly simple. You click on the letters tab right on the left hand side or you can click on letters right over there. So I'm going to click over there and then it's going to open up the page that says what letters I have sent to the, previ uh, to the tenant previously. And we can see that uh, Joe and Jane received a landlord welcome letter, a tenant welcome letter. They've already see received a 20 business day letter of demand, a cancellation letter as well as another registered letter of demand. So there's been a lot of communication with this tenant. So we can already see that this tenant might not have been the best payer during the lease period. But it's so simple. Just go and click here to send a new letter. Now from this page over here, you might not realize this, but TPN has a lot of letters that you can send through the system. So let's talk a little bit about my favorite letter. And strangely enough, my favorite letter as an attorney is not sending out a letter of demand. Because like I said, if you're sending out a letter of demand, it already means that something's gone wrong. The tenant hasn't paid you. We have this fantastic letter called a tenant welcome letter right down at the bottom. And it's absolutely for free to send. You can download it. You can email it directly through here. But you can just click over there to send that letter. And what that is, is it communicates with the tenant prior to them actually being in the premises of who TPN is, what the estate agent or the landlord in this instance is busy doing, how they're communicating and how they are submitting certain sets of data through to the bureau so that the tenant already knows that there is a repercussion should payment not occur during the lease period. So that letter for free, it's so simple to send and it's really going to be a proactive step in actually collecting rent further on. But I'm sure you'd all like to know how to send letters of demand because you're probably joining us today because you might have some delinquent tenants that this needs to be done on. So I'm going to go into one of these letters and then I'm just going to sketch a little bit of a story for you and I'm going to tell you a little bit about letters of demand and placing tenants in breach because I always feel that if people understand where the letters of demand comes from, where it comes from in the law, and why we're busy doing this, it makes so much more sense. And this process actually gets simplified as a result. So for today's purposes, I'm going to send a registered 20-day letter of demand. The reason for this already 
is because I know the tenants are natural people and the lease agreement is still in its fixed term. But you don't even need to worry about that because the TPN system does it for you. So all your CPA compliance checks directly through the system as well. So you just go and click there to send a new letter. Then it's going to open up a page like this and I just want to halt here. Remember what I said at the beginning, there are two tenants on this lease and you need to send two letters of demand to those tenants, to those specific tenants. So Joe needs to receive a letter and Jay needs to receive a letter because both of those tenants are tenants in terms of the lease. And you cannot place one in breach and the other not in breach. So make sure you're doing this. Make sure you're having a look at your lease agreement prior to sending the letters to make sure that you've got all the parties on the lease being letters sent to. So I'm going to click here. First letter I'm going to send is to Joe. I'm going to click on that and I'm going to click next. Then, like I told you, the TPN system does the CPA or Consumer Protection Act compliance check automatically for you through the system. So you can just go and select. And as we all know, this lease agreement is still in its fixed term. So the contract ends on a specific date. It's got a specific start date and it's got a specific termination date. And we go and click over there. Then we know that the landlord in this instance is a natural person. So we're going to click over there and the tenant is also natural people. Remember Joe and Jane blogs, they've got ID numbers, they're natural people, they're natural people consumers, and we're gonna click over there. And then we just click the validate button. And immediately this page pops up, but what we can see over here is that the CPA compliance check has already been run. So it says, the contract is signed after, on or after 1st of April 2011 with a natural person, that's when the CPA became uh, applicable to us. The CPA does apply. Please allow the tenant 20 business days to remedy the breach. And then you can just go and fill out all these details. Jade, do we have any questions so far, perhaps? Yes, we do have a question, Peter. Yes. Deborah and Snayman would like to know how it works for commercial tenants. Fantastic. Okay. I should have mentioned this right at the start, but this system, how the letters of demand has been sent and actually collection procedure in general, is exactly the same whether you are an estate agent, whether you are an individual landlord just doing residential properties, or whether you are a bigger company just doing commercial. Strangely enough, the law does not change when it comes to sending out letters of demand and proper collection procedure. So you can follow exactly the same procedure that I'm showing you here for residential tenants, for commercial tenants, whether you're an individual landlord, whether you're an estate agent, um, you can follow exactly the same process. We just have another quick question from Norma Mtetwa. She would like to know what is the benefit of sending a registered 20 business day letter of demand as opposed to the normal via email? That is a fantastic question, Jade. I actually wanted to get into this when we did notices in domicilium, but it doesn't matter. Let's answer this question now. It really does depend on your individual lease agreement with the tenant. What I always tell clients is when they're sending out letters of demand to make sure they go and have a look at something called their notices and domicilium clause. It is clause 27, I believe, in the TPN residential lease pack, but is a clause that dictates how communication and formal communication must be sent and must be communicated with the tenant during the tenancy. So that's the clause that says a letter or a notice must be sent by post, by email, by fax, all of these different delivery methods, but your notices and domicilium clause is vitally important because you need to know how to send those communications out. TPN has a fantastic notices and domicilium clause. I don't mind sounding pompous about this, but we've got something called deemed receipt. And what that means is when you send out the email uh, or the letter of demand or notice by email or, or another form or method of communication, that letter has been deemed to have been received on a certain day. But you need to make sure about your own lease agreement. So you need to go and check out your notices and domicilium clause on how those letters or notices must be delivered to the tenant during the tenancy. Thanks, Jade. Moving on. So we've got that CPA compliance check. You've already done that. We can see that the CPA applies and you need to send out a specific letter. So starting from this, let's start right over here and let's explain a little bit about how the law works 
when it comes to letters of demand and placing tenants in breach. I'm sure you've all heard the term placing a tenant in breach. So, a question here, a rhetorical question, is is your tenant in breach when they don't pay you? Strangely enough, no. The only time that the tenant is in breach is when you, as the landlord or as the estate agent, place the tenant in mura, which means you have sent a letter of demand, you have placed them in breach of the specific contract. They are not just automatically in breach as a result of the non-payment. You need to place them in breach. And that's why I'm saying this is all a procedure. Because unless you send a letter of demand and unless you follow correct procedure, you're not actually placing that tenant in breach. So another question is how many letters of demand must I send to the tenant to place them in breach? Easy answer, only one. You cannot be more in breach than what you are when a person's already placed in breach. Breach is unequivocal. You're either in breach or you're not. You've either been placed in breach or you're not. So, you send out a single letter of demand. And should the tenant not make remedy, not pay you within that specified time period in the letter of demand, you can follow further procedure. So, do you see how that works? You need to place the tenant in breach because the tenant is not yet in breach until you send the letter of demand. So this is why the letters of demand must go out as soon as possible. Telephone calls and sending WhatsApps and sending SMSs and reminders is not placing the tenant in breach. The actual formal communication in terms of the lease agreement needs to be sent out to place that specific tenant in breach of contract. So the default date is quite easy. This is the initial non-payment date that the tenant has not paid you. So in terms of your TPN lease agreement that I'm sure all of you are busy using, tenants must pay and the amount must clear on or before the first. So legally and technically speaking, if that has not occurred, you can send the letter of, of demand already out on the second or the third of the month. Sooner is better. And the reason why I'm saying this is remember, if you're sending out a 20 business day letter of demand, and you're only sending out letters of demand on the 7th or 8th or 9th or 10th of the month, you're only placing tenants in breach at that point in time. But more so, that 20 business day time period granted might move into the next month of payment. And that may become a little bit of an issue because what if the tenant makes a payment thereafter in the second month? They're still in breach of contract, of course, because you've placed them in breach. But sending out the letters of demand and placing tenants in breach sooner rather than later is so vitally important for your proper collection procedure. So you go and fill that out. The default date in this instance might be 01-10-2020. The amount due. Remember, letters of demand are not just sent out for non-payment of rental. It could be for ancillary expenses as well. Could be for um, uh, water, electricity. Anything that is on the property that is due and owing to the landlord at that point in time. Your statement value, you go and fill that out. And then the contact person. Now this is important and I always make a joke about this. But I know some of you have my personal cell phone number and my name. Please don't go and fill out Peter Menon and my cell phone number at contact number and contact person. Because tenants call me and I've got no idea what to say to them. So you're going to go fill out the contact person and the contact number of the person in your office who is going to be dealing with the tenant uh, when they're contacting you about the letter of demand. It's as simple as that. And then we can have a look at the associated payments. So we can actually see on Joe and Jane blogs on the specific lease agreement that this tenant hasn't made great payments. During June, there was a paid late. July did not pay. August did not pay. But we're only sending out a letter of demand now. Remember what we said about clause 27 of the TPN lease and the notices and domicilium clause and what you need to go and check specifically on your own lease agreement. This is where this all comes together. You need to go and select delivery options based on your specific lease agreement. So how the registered letter or the normal snail mail or the email must actually go send, be sent out. This is automatically pre-populated for you if you submit data. So it's as simple as actually just going to click on the account you're going to send an SMS to, it's obviously not going to deliver the entire letter of demand to the tenant over SMS. It is going to do so over email and you can CC in yourself 
um, or let's call it the business manager if you'd like, so that they know that the letter of demand has actually been sent. You click on the delivery confirmation and then you go and send the letter. And like magic, that letter has now been delivered. Without you having to go to the post office or anything like that, TPN does that all for you. And we deliver that letter either by registered post, we deliver that by normal mail, we deliver that by email as well through the system automatically. Jade, I think we've got a couple of questions most probably on that already. We definitely have a couple of questions, Peter. Marissa Ramdahl would like to know, how can you view the contents of the TPN letters without sending the letter? Uh, wonderful. Uh, we can actually send you a sample of the letter. You're more than welcome to contact Help Desk or myself to do so if you'd like to see what the TPN letter of demand currently states. However, if you have already sent a letter of demand to a tenant, there's a way of viewing that letter as well through the system. And that's simply by clicking on the little folder right over here. And it's going to download a copy of the letter actually sent to the tenant. But if you want to have a look at our wording, you're more than welcome to contact us so that I can send you through a sample letter of uh, what we sent through on TPN. Karen Mask. Karen Marx asks, how effective is a letter of demand from TPN versus a letter of demand from a lawyer? I love that question. Okay, so we send letters of demand through the TPN collection service. Uh, it is actually a registered debt collector. We send uh, those letters directly through from there. What I have found in my own personal experience talking about practical methods, and remember I was an attorney sending out lots of letters of demand a day and uh, attempting to evict uh, tenants from premises. What I saw is that a letter of demand sent directly through from TPN as a credit bureau, as a collection service, has a big impact because tenants already know that the immediate repercussion for the non-payment has created on their specific credit profile. Whereas getting a letter of demand from an attorney or another service, that is not made apparent. So there's no specific immediate repercussion because just imagine if you're a tenant and you receive a letter of demand that letter of demand states please pay us within a certain time period it's not as if the immediate repercussion has been pointed out to the tenant at that point in time and that's what the tpn letter of demand does from the great get-go is there anything else jade there's plenty of questions Peter. plenty we of can questions we can deal with one or two more perfect okay so Kelly Hampson asks, how many days after default of payment is the letter of demand sent out? Seven days. Okay, I actually like this question. Let's preempt this in a little bit of uh, a little bit of a different way. I'm sure you've all heard about the grace period myth. This is a myth that some tenants have in their mind that they've got this grace period to pay rental between the first and the seventh of the month. I don't know where this was created. It might have been through the Rental Housing Act when the Rental Housing Act says that should the tenant uh, not pay rental, you need to send them a seven day letter of demand in terms of the RHA. But there's no such thing as a grace period in law. If your contract says that the tenant must pay on or before the first, the tenant must pay on or before the first. So you can, if the tenant has not done so, and with the TPN uh, lease agreements, like I said, it says it must pay and clear on them before the first, then legally speaking, you would be able to send a letter of demand as soon as that payment has not been reflected in the account after the first of the month. So there's no such thing as that seven day grace period myth. Okay, last question for now. Thanks, Jade. Eagle Properties asks, if tenants have already left the unit and did not pay the last month's rent, we use the deposit for damages. How long do we have to place our tenants on terms for? Seven days or 20 business days? Both are individuals. So unfortunately, because the lease agreement is still in its fixed term time period during the last uh, month of the rental, you will have to send a 20 business day letter of demand. I actually, strangely enough, had a telephone call right before the session about this. And I told the client it, it, it is a little bit of a difficult situation because you need to send that letter of demand most certainly. But remember, because you're submitting data into the TPN system, you're already affecting that tenant's credit profile because you're going to mark the last month as it did not pay. For next time that the tenant is applying for a rental or something like that, you'll be able to see that the tenant is historically 
not paying the last month of the rental. So that's the right way of going about it. But unfortunately, you still need to send the 20 business day letter of demand. So Thank Peter, how yes, would yes. that be different if the tenant had vacated already, but there was still an amount outstanding? Of course. So if the tenant is vacated already and they're out of the property, remember the fixed term contract has, uh, has come to an end. So you're more than welcome to send a seven calendar day letter of demand, exactly the same through the system. You just click the seven calendar day letter of demand and that letter of demand will be delivered. Remember, we're going to talk a little bit about something different when we go into blacklisting. So I didn't even want to touch on blacklisting prior to this point in time, but you will be able to send that seven calendar day letter of demand. But wait, we'll get into blacklisting right now and I'm going to show you why sending a 20 business day letter of demand and sending it out in a specific manner might just aid a little bit with blacklisting. Good. Thank you, Jade. So moving swiftly forward, we've now sent that letter of demand to both Joe and Jane blogs. Now, one thing that I do just quickly want to show you off the system prior to us heading into blacklisting is proper cancellation procedure. This is something that is coming about more and more and more at this point in time because regardless of what the current alert level 2 and alert level 1 regulations state regarding evictions. Remember, what the alert level 2 and 1 regulations currently say is that a competent court may grant an order for eviction if it is just and equitable. However, the order for the execution, so actually the sheriff going out and evicting the person formally or forcibly from the premises is stayed or suspended until the end of the national state of disaster which is set currently at 15th of October but we're probably going to have an extension until 15th of November so there is a goalpost shift. Regardless you still need to follow this procedure remember you still need to send out letters of demand and you still need to cancel lease agreements because even if you cannot necessarily or don't necessarily want to approach the courts at this point in time for the eviction order or rather for the execution of the eviction order you still need to follow this process so cancellation comes up a lot and we get a lot of questions about this on a daily basis so let's just clear out a lot of confusion here as well so once again joe and jane blocks his account i am going to click on the letters tab right over there it's going to open up that page once again on sent letters i'm going to click there again and it's going to open up the page that allows me to send different letters to the tenant now we've discussed the tenant welcome letter, we've discussed the letters of demand. We've discussed a little bit about the time periods, but we're going to go into that a little bit more when we go into the cancellation specifically. So this lease cancellation or notice to vacate is right up at the top. And this is only used in very specific instances. So I want you to get this right. So we talk a lot about month to month contracts and sending out a calendar month's notice to terminate the lease agreement. This has nothing to do with that. Okay, nothing to do with that. A letter of cancellation or cancellation in its basic format is a right. It's a right that me as the landlord has in law and in terms of my contract to do when a tenant does not do a certain thing in the time period provided by the letter of demand. So they don't remedy the breach in full at that point in time. So this letter of cancellation will only be sent out in that specific instance. So once again, letters of demand, you need to send two if there are two tenants on the property. Remember Joe and Jane and same with cancellation letters because you need to cancel the lease agreement with both parties. So we're going to select Joe there. We are going to go next. And then we have a look at this. So this is incredibly important. And I want you to take a step back here and think about it. So this process is only followed when I have sent a letter of demand. I've sent the letter of demand. I've given the tenant a certain time period, whether that be the seven calendar day time period, if the CPA does not apply, section 14, or the 20 business day time period when the CPA does apply, section 14. This can only be sent out when the time period given in that letter has prescribed, so it has ended, and the tenant has not remedied the breach in full. 
So if there's any arrears outstanding, the tenant might have made a partial payment, this letter can still be sent. But it can only happen in those instances. You can only cancel the lease agreement in those instances. I always love to go uh, with clients during training sessions and what's the differences between cancellation and termination, but perhaps we're going to leave that for a next training session. But this is cancellation. It's a right that I have. In terms of the contract, it is a remedy that I can elect when the tenant has not paid me in that time period. What I go and input over here is the letter of demand date. So that's the date that the letter was sent. We're going to take that date, we're going to count our 20 business day time period, and then we can send the letter of cancellation on the 21st business day thereafter. For seven calendar days, you're obviously going to count your calendar days. Here I'm going to stop you. If you're unsure of how the days count, trust me, I was a candidate attorney, I made a massive mistake in counting days, and I repudiated a lease agreement by cancelling it too early because I didn't take certain days into consideration, like public holidays when you're counting business days. So you're more than welcome. If you're unsure of how to count the days, contact the help desk, contact the legal department. We'll be able to assist you with counting of those days as well. But you input the letter of demand date. The vacate date is the date that the tenant must, legally speaking, be out of the premises. We would suggest, um, so for example, you're canceling a lease agreement on a Monday, perhaps give them until the end of the week to vacate the property, but please don't give them a full month to vacate because it's very possible that through weird, strange process and uh, perhaps accepting rental during that time that you are reinstating the lease agreement tacitly between the parties. This is a complex, complex way of explaining it, but regardless, you might do that. So we would suggest just give them a week or so to vacate the property. Then we can have a look at the associated payments. Paid on time, paid on time, paid on time, paid late, did not pay, did not pay, like we saw, uh, showed you previously, and the delivery options. We just go and click on delivery confirmation over there. Remember, all this is pre-populated for you, and you click to send the letter. So what this letter does, it is cancels the contract between the landlord and the tenant, and it places the tenant into illegal occupation of the premises after cancellation and this needs to occur prior to you actually going to court to um, evict the tenant from the property or starting the eviction process so the letter of demand the cancellation letter i told you it's going to be process based you need to do both of these to keep you in legal good standing through the collections procedure and then you just click delivery confirmation right at the bottom and click send letter. And once again, like magic, that letter has gone out to the tenant and TPN does everything for you. Jade, I'm sure we might have a couple of questions on cancellation as well. We do have a couple of questions. Angela Sibanda would like to know, she says she sent her tenant a letter of demand and cancelled the lease, but they still did not move out. So what is the next step? Angela, um, you're more than welcome to contact us afterwards so that I can chat to you um, and explain the eviction procedure to you. Um, but it would seem like at this point in time, you need to contact evic uh, attorneys, specifically eviction attorneys, to assist you in drafting the documentation and the applications to proceed with eviction on that tenant. Remember, there's only one way of proceeding with eviction in South Africa as well. That's dealt with in terms of a lot of case law, but also in terms of the Prevention of Illegal Evictions Act when you're dealing with residential property specifically, and it's a process that needs to be followed. So you're more than welcome to send me through your details. I'm sure Jade will put up our email addresses in the chat as well, and then I can explain the procedure to you and perhaps even refer you to attorneys that will be able to assist you with the eviction process. Okay, Audre Robinson asks, what do you do in the case if a tenant has absconded, they haven't left you with the forwarding address, but you are aware that he reads his WhatsApp messages? Of course. So there's a possible way of tracing the tenant through TPN. So perhaps they've taken up another lease agreement or they've even purchased a property. And the way to do that is actually just going into your credit checks tab right over there. You can have a look at the trace consumer right over there by ID, passport number, surname, date of birth and telephone number. And we might give you updated details where those uh, letters of demand can be sent. Regardless, 
Remember, in terms of your lease agreement, if the tenant has agreed to email service and email communication, in terms of your notices and domicilium clause and you've filled it out correctly, it is possible to send out those letters of demand also by email. So it might just make things a little bit easier. Okay. Andrea Kruger asks, she says here, cancellation of the lease, does it only comply to rental or can it be used for complaints received through the body corporate? Ooh, um, interesting question. We actually did a quite ex big expose on this when I was still, in, still an attorney in practice. Um, specifically, if body corporates have the right to cancel lease agreements with tenants. They most certainly do not. Only the landlord and the tenant has the leasing relationship, has the relationship built by the lease agreement, and only the landlord will be able to cancel the lease agreement. So in instances where a tenant might be in breach of body corporate rules, we get this very often, tenants parking in the wrong spaces, uh, tenants perhaps having um, over-occupancy, um, perhaps tampering with meters, all of that, that can be handled by the body corporate at a up to a certain point in time, like sending out notices and perhaps levying penalties for certain of these things but at the end of the day the landlord needs to pull the trigger with a letter of demand as well as through with the cancellation and actually the eviction process needs to be done by then they are the only people that have locus standi or standing in court to perform the eviction specifically on that tenant last question for now Thanks, peter Joe. and this also piggybacks on the question you just answered this is from jill spencer she wants to know if a tenant is has a two months notice lease in his lease and he's not abiding by the body corporate rules but he is paying his rental can we give notice and cancel the lease or and must the notice be the full two months period it is very possible that a lot of lease agreements contain clauses like that um, what I would suggest uh, for the, the client specifically is to send me an email so that I can have a look at your lease agreement. I just want to check if everything's 100% legal and how that clause has been drafted. There is a possibility that you can give notice, but the notice must be done in terms of the lease. And, and really that depends on how month has even been uh, defined in terms of the lease agreement, because it might be a calendar month, it might be a normal month. So the notice period might change depending on the interpretation. So what I would suggest is send me through the lease agreement, let me have a look at it for you, but it might be possible, like you said, to terminate or cancel the lease agreement in way of notice rather than following the letter of demand cancellation process because the tenant is not in breach at this point in time so it might be possible but I'd love to see the lease agreement just to make sure thanks Jade and then last thing I just want to show you on the system and this might take a while and I'm sure we're gonna get a lot of questions regarding this as well is blacklisting or default listing through the TPN system specifically now go and click on my data once again we are going to scroll down to those tenants, Joe and Jane blogs. We're going to click on that. And then it's going to open up the lease summary, like we said. And then off the left-hand tab, there's a black listings tab right over there, or there's a listings tab right over there. So very similar to the letters of demand. I'm going to click on blacklisting. It's going to open up a page that looks like this for me. It's going to tell me all the active listings on this account, so whether the tenants have been blacklisted previously and how many times they've been blacklisted previously, as well as deleted or expired listings. So perhaps those letters or the blacklistings have, have expired in the past. Click here to add a new blacklisting record. Then it's going to open up a page that looks like this, and this is a very simple process to follow. But it's a process nonetheless. Like what we've got letters of demand, like what we've got with the cancellation, there's a very specific legal process that is regulated in terms of our law, in terms of your lease agreement that you need to follow. And this is specifically regulated in terms of the National Credit Act. So you need to follow this specific procedure to blacklist. So, without giving too much away, the two things that you need to take note of over here, two blacklist tenants, is... The tenant needs to be three consecutive billing cycles or months in arrears. That means, as an explanation, the tenant needs to be January, February, March in arrears. That means they either need to have made non-payments, so did not pay on that account, or partial payments. But they needed to have been arrears, in arrears for three consecutive billing cycles. The second thing that you need to note is a letter of demand needs to have been sent that specifically states that should the tenant not make payment within 20 business days the tenant 
may be blacklisted or their credit profile is negatively affected. Now this is so incredibly important because if you're sending out your own letters of demand, it needs to stipulate a specific clause like that. But I would just suggest, send the TPN letter of demand. We know it's fully compliant in terms of the CPA, RHA, as well as the National Credit Act, and that you can actually go and blacklist on those letters of demand. It's very, very specific, and you need to have that clause inputted in your LOD. Now you go and fill out a default date. Once again, that's the initial non-payment date, like we, we did on the letters of demand. You can go select a rating, there's a TPN only listing and a TPN and TransUnion listing. What we would suggest at this point in time is listing both on TPN as well as TransUnion because then more service and credit providers will obviously see that the tenant has been blacklisted. So we're going to choose something like final notice. We're going to click list on TransUnion right over there. And then we're going to fill out the amount due. And this is the full entire statement value, everything that is currently outstanding. Remember, you're taking those three consecutive billing cycles into account over here, and you're going to fill out an amount due. And then you can write a short little reason. Okay, Twitter length, the tenant has not paid me in three months, whatever it might be. You can go and have a look at the associated payments. And then remember, the NCA compliance declaration right down the bottom is incredibly important. It says that I have followed correct procedure to blacklist the tenant. So don't try and blacklist tenants when you haven't followed correct procedure. It's a specific procedure to follow. What I can strangely enough see from this account already is just having a look at this is we've got a paid late, did not pay, did not pay. If you've got this right, you would have said, no, we cannot blacklist on this lease you would be 100% correct. The reason for that is because this is a paid late. That means the tenant might have been arrears at the beginning of the month, but at the end of the month, they paid that amount up. So if this was a partial payment or it did not pay, I would have been able to blacklist at this point in time. But in terms of this lease, I would not. But regardless, let's call this a partial payment or it did not pay. We would be able to click here, save the listing, and immediately the tenant's credit profile has been affected through the blacklisting and the listing has been loaded both on TPN and TransUnion. Wonderful. Jade, that actually brings us to the end of our formal training session today. I'm sure we've got a lot of questions. We've got around about uh, 15 minutes to do some Q&A. Remember, those feedback forms are now available on your Q&A. Go and fill those out for us, please, and they will be made available for 45 minutes hereafter. But let's just get into it, Jade. Lovely. Hey, Peter. Heather Kirkland asks, how long does the blacklisting last on the TPN system, and can you keep the blacklisting updated after this period? You only have one bite at the apple. So if you load a blacklisting record onto a tenant's profile, that blacklisting record will stay active on the tenant's profile for 12 months. So that's a very short time period. It's only one year. Let's just talk a little bit more about the data specifically. Data that you submit into TPN, the payment profile records that you submit on a monthly basis, that actually stays on a credit, tenant's credit profile for a full five years. So it's a lot longer than what you would have the blacklisting, but a blacklisting only 12 months. Yes, Jade. Next. Okay. Next, we have Mia DeVet. Can you blacklist a current tenant or is the letter only for tenants who have already vacated? You can definitely blacklist a tenant that is currently in your premises. Um, However, if you need to do so, just from a legal standpoint, and perhaps this is my own personal opinion, but I'm going to give it anyway because we're doing a practical session today, you should have already contacted eviction attorneys to start the eviction proceedings on the tenant. Because remember, at the point of blacklisting, the tenant is already three consecutive billing cycles in arrears. So the letters of demand, even the cancellation of the lease agreement, should have, in my mind, already occurred. Um, and the uh, attorneys, whoever they might, have, might be, should have already started drafting at least eviction application on this tenant. Blacklisting a tenant is not going to get them out of your property. It is going to mark their credit profile as a default, as a bad payer, but it is not going to get the tenant out of your property. There's only one procedure to follow with that, and that is eviction. Okay. Daphne Oliver asks, a owner does not repair alterations as promised. At the end of the lease, the owner gives the tenant notice. The tenant doesn't pay rent and asks for the deposit back to be used for rent in the last month. 
will the tenant be blacklisted? Uh, the tenant might not be blacklisted because remember the owner still needs to follow that process. It doesn't just happen automatically. Regardless, even if the owner did not perform maintenance, so let's take a little bit of a step back if you don't mind with that question. Like I told you right at the beginning, sending out letters of demand and actually placing in parties in breach of their lease terms. Remember, this can happen both ways. This can happen in an instance where the tenant doesn't pay rent, the, uh, the example we gave today, and the landlord sends a letter of demand to force the tenant or demand of the tenant to make the rental payments within that time period. But also, and this happens more and more and more, is that landlords are perhaps not performing maintenance on the property or they're performing ill maintenance on the property. What is the tenant's right in this regard? It is exactly the same as what the landlord has. The tenant needs to place the landlord in breach of the lease terms because they are supposed to, in terms of the contract, maintain the premises. So the tenant can also send the landlord a letter of demand in an instance like that and demand of them that they perform in terms of the contract by performing the maintenance. Should this not occur, the tenant has exactly the same rights as the landlord, and that includes the right to cancel the lease agreement. But that's digressing a little bit. I just wanted to give you the legal background here. Remember also that if a party is not placed in breach, they're actually not placed in breach. So even if the tenant might have complained about the maintenance that was not performed on the property, if the landlord was not formally placed in breach, they are not formally in breach. So the tenant is also in the wrong by not paying the last month's rental. The landlord would have been able to send a letter of demand at that instance. And in most probable cases, would have been able to retain the deposit for either the damages caused on the property by the tenant during the duration or for the arrear rental portion that might be outstanding. But remember, blacklisting is a process and the landlord needs to follow that process. So unless he's actually formally followed that process, the tenant won't be automatically blacklisted. Okay, Marilise Junius asks, what happens if the tenant pays partially after the letter of demand? Do you need to send a new LOD and does the process start from scratch? Thank you so much for that question. Um, I love sort of uh, figuring out uh, the misconceptions in the marketplace about letters of demand. It makes me actually very happy because I'm so glad that people can, after a session like this, sort of figure out the correct procedure to follow. A letter of demand is sent out, it places the tenant in breach. Remember, you cannot be 10% in breach, or 20% in breach, or 30% in breach. You are either in breach of contract, or you're not in breach of contract. So, once the letter of, de of demand has been sent out, the tenant is placed in breach. Should they make a partial payment during that time period, it does not remedy the breach, because remember, they need to make the full payment to remedy the breach in that instance. So the tenant would still be in breach of contract even though a partial payment is made and all the remedies and rights that I've just discussed with you regarding cancellation and blacklisting will still be in a, a, applicable because the tenant is still in arrears. Okay, Monique asks, if the lease is on a month-to-month -month basis, do we need to send a letter of demand for each month? Uh, great question. So, letters of demand, when the lease is on a month-to-month -month basis. Remember, fixed term contracts only apply to section 14 of the CPA. So that 20 business days notice we were talking about only applies for fixed term contracting. Month-to-month -month lease agreements are not fixed term contracts. They periodic contracts that almost gets renewed each and every single month on a month-to-month -month basis automatically. For a lease agreement on a month-to-month -month basis, you can send a seven-day letter of demand and the same process applies. So if the tenant does not pay you, within the seven calendar day time period given, you are allowed once again to send out your cancellation letter and elect the remedy, the right of cancellation that that landlord has over the lease agreement. So you can place the tenant in breach, same complete thing that you've got with a fixed term contract, the time period is just a little bit shorter with your seven calendar days rather than your 20 business day letter of demand. So Iona Skultz wants to know, she says her tenant signed the deposit utilization agreement and they were supposed to repay the deposit by 1 September. All his rent is paid to date, but he has not paid the two months deposit. Should she send a letter of demand? Iona, I would definitely suggest so. You can send a letter of demand for the unpaid portion of the deposit. Um, just taking this a little bit back, remember what I said right at the beginning, a letter of demand places the tenant in breach of any obligation that they may have had in terms of the lease agreement. So you can send a letter of demand for unpaid deposit, for unpaid utilities, 
uh, for unpaid rental. It all falls into exactly the same category and you should send those letters of demand as well, definitely. Thanks, Ayana. Heidi Albrecht wants to know if you can add the cost of the letter of demand, demand to the arrears amount. Hi, Heidi. Yes, it is possible. We're going to have to have a look at your lease agreements, but I think you're using TPN lease agreements anyway. Um, it would be possible, but it must be the specific amount that TPN or whatever service provider has charged the um, estate agent or the landlord for that letter. You can't make money out of sending out the letters of demand. Remember also, for certain procedure that you might follow, like sending out SMSs, making telephone calls, time spent on matters during collection, you won't be able to ch charge that to the tenant. There is perhaps a small exception to that rule, is that if you are a registered debt collector, you will be able to charge certain other charges, but only in terms of the Debt Collectors Act and only in terms of their specific regulations on what you may charge. Thanks, Peter. Kirsty Dalton would like to know if the lease has been cancelled and the letter of demand has not been paid, but the tenant pays up within seven days once notice of cancellation has been given. Do you have to enter into a new lease or is it automatically on a month-to-month -month basis? Sorry, my eyes went very, very big over there because the lease agreement was cancelled and a letter of demand was being sent. It's quite an interesting concept because once again, if the, let if the lease has been cancelled, the tenant's already in illegal occupation. So no further letter of demand should have been sent at that point in time. To get a little bit technical here, sorry about this, um, if you as an agent or as a landlord have cancelled a lease agreement. Remember now what we've done is we've elected the remedy, we've elected the right, we've cancelled the lease agreement, we've ended the contract between the landlord and the tenant. By sending out a further letter of demand, what are you demanding? You are demanding rental. Now rental is not payable when a contract has been cancelled. Damages are payable or holding over damages that is the same amount that the rental might be in terms of the contract but it's no longer called rental so please don't send letters of demand when lease agreements have already been procedurally and correctly been cancelled because it's very possible that through an instance like that you reinstate the lease agreement you reactivate the lease agreement and uh, it's possible that you might have a problem thereafter with eviction or with cancellation even thereafter so I would suggest to that client, once again, use the legal email address, send myself, Greg or Jade, an email, and we'll be able to assist you with that query thereafter. We need to have a look at the chronology of everything that has happened prior to the cancellation or prior to sending out the new LOD. Okay, question from Zoe936. She wants to know, can you blacklist the tenant immediately after they have defaulted on an acknowledgement of debt? Um, interesting question. So an acknowledgement of debt is obviously a document like a settlement agreement uh, for all of those that uh, don't necessarily understand the acknowledgement of debt. So say for example, you are the tenant, I am the landlord, you haven't necessarily paid me rental during the lease period. When you vacate, we sign a document that says you should repay the unpaid portion over a certain period of time. Now if the tenant Ooh, I'm going to sound a little bit pompous here, I apologize. But if you're using the TPN acknowledgement of debts, we've actually got very clever clauses written into those AODs, which allows the landlord at an instance where the tenant defaults in terms of the AOD to actually approach the court directly to issue a court order and perhaps even a warrant directly on that AOD. So that might be possible. Um, if the tenant should not pay in terms of the AOD and they're no longer in the property, there's no real reason at that point in time to specifically send out a formalized letter of demand. It might be, uh, it might be applicable if you want a blacklist or something like that. You have to have a look whether the tenant is the three consecutive billing cycles. Remember, this process still applies in arrears and thereafter when that LOD has prescribed you would be able to blacklist the tenant. So there's a couple of options there strangely enough with the AOD. Uh, once again if you're stuck on that please send us an email we're more than glad to assist on something like that as well. Next question Peter. Theo Potkita says he's a landlord. There's still rental outstanding on property that has been sold. Can he still send a letter of demand? Okay so a property that has been sold to a new party. The new party or the, let's call it the purchaser, automatically steps into the shoes 
of the seller or the old owner of the property by operation of law. You might have heard this term previously. It's called hier gaat voorkoop. It means, technically speaking, that the new purchaser merely steps into the shoes of the previous landlord or owner of the premises and takes over all the rights, responsibilities and duties in terms of that contract. So it really does depend when the transfer occurred because the tenant might be owing um, the current landlord the money whereas in certain instances it might be possible that the tenant might might be possible that the tenant owes the previous owner money as well so we need to have a look at the chronology it's quite a difficult question to answer during a session like this please pop us an email afterwards and we'll get to that question right away is that done for the session thank you so much Everybody, I hope you have a fantastic day further. Please remember to fill out those feedback forms. The bit.ly link is in the description and the Q&A provided. Um, and remember to subscribe to the TPN YouTube channel for any further updates and ring that notification bell. Have a great day further.